Well, it's good to be here this morning, and it's good to, uh, to have this opportunity to, uh, to be able to minister from God's Word. This indeed is a, uh, a fabulous portion of the book of Romans as we have celebrated in song just uh, over the last uh, 20 minutes or so, the incredible victory that the Lord Jesus Christ has given us through his death on the cross. And today we're going to start by looking at the first 11 verses of uh, the book of Romans, or rather the chapter, Romans chapter 6. Thanks, Megan. <clears throat> now the context of this passage, uh, if we sort of look at what we've been studying in the book of, of, uh, of Romans, is that indeed our sins are forgiven by faith in Jesus Christ. And that justification, that is the forgiveness of sins, is a free gift from God. Last week, Brother Don uh, led us through the last portion of chapter 5, and we saw two streams, uh, so to speak. That sin, death, and condemnation came through Adam. But that forgiveness, life, and every spiritual blessing that God ever intended us to have has come through the Lord Jesus Christ. And we saw in verse 20 of chapter 5 that it says that moreover the law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace abounded much more. There's no amount of sin that Jesus Christ's death hasn't dealt with at at Calvary's cross. No matter how much trouble you found yourself in, no matter how deeply you've become mired in sin, that Christ's work at Calvary's cross is powerful enough to deal with that. That God's grace abounds far more than sin abounds. Now, for some, that raises a problem. And Paul's going to deal with that problem today. Some would say that if that's the case, if Christ's sacrifice on the cross is great enough to deal with all the sin that I could ever do, then maybe I'll just keep on sinning. Or perhaps that's what you Christians teach, that you can just say, well, I believe in Jesus Christ and just keep on living the way that you lived before. Others have trouble, believers, others who have put their trust in the Lord Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of their sins, have trouble accepting that they have that kind of security in Jesus Christ. That if I put my trust in him, that my sins are forgiven past, present, and future. Some would say, surely... I must be required to maintain my acceptance with God in some way. That I need to do a certain amount of good works, or if I sin too much, then perhaps I might lose my salvation. That raises another question, is how much sin is too much for a believer? Paul seeks to deal with that question in this chapter that we're going to look at this morning. And when we consider questions like this, like, what about sin as a believer? What about sin in my life? And is it okay for me to keep sinning? And questions like that. It's important for us to depart from the realm of what I think and what my personal opinion is and make sure that we're dwelling in in the realm of facts, in particular, God's facts. I wonder how many of you remember these two fellows on the screen. I see some of us that have some gray hairs are smiling, and maybe some of the younger ones are going, who are those guys? I grew up watching uh, this show with my parents when I was just a little kid. The show was called Dragnet, and it was a detective show. And often the the fellow on the left, uh, the actor's name is Jack Webb, and his name in the show was uh, Sergeant, what, do you remember? Joe Friday, yeah. And often they'd go to a crime scene and there'd be some guy that had committed a crime or he'd done something wrong or whatever. And they'd go to the crime scene and they would would, uh, ask questions of this fellow's wife or his girlfriend or whatever. And that person would become very emotional and and start to tell all of uh, what they thought and and what their feelings were and, and what might have happened and all of that. And of course, what would Sergeant Joe Friday say? This is the classic line in this movie he would look at, at, at the woman and say, just the facts, ma'am. You remember that? Just the facts, ma'am. Uh, some of us that uh, perhaps uh, haven't been around for 40 or more years might not remember that. Some of you maybe have seen this show on some of these um, uh, retro cable stations or whatever. I know 
in a few vacations that we've taken down in the States, and they have lots of those sorts of stations in the, st- in the States. And uh, we've watched this with our kids. Megan's sitting here chuckling <laughs> because we used to, we used to sometimes when we go on vacation, we, after a day on the slope skiing, whatever, we'd be sitting in the hot tub and we'd be saying, and the names have been changed to protect the innocent or whatever. You know, We had fun watching this show as a family. But I put this up here because when it comes to questions like, is it okay for me to sin? And what about the Christian sinning? We need to depart from the realm of feelings and emotions and what I think and make sure that we are grounded and rooted in the facts of God. Just God's facts. Because that's what the Christian faith is all about. So what are the facts according to God? Well, again, just by way of setting the table a little bit, you'll remember that as we went through the first two and a half chapters of Romans, that it explains that the whole world stands condemned before God as sinners. That there's none righteous, not even one. That all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But then we, as we begin to get into the latter part of, of chapter 3, we begin to see this wonderful salvation that God has provided for us. And in particular, our justification, that is, the forgiveness of sins. We see in God describing the salvation that we have in Jesus Christ in this book of Romans, that the first thing he talks about is how he has dealt with the symptoms of our sin problem. What are the symptoms? Well, there are sins, our sinful acts. And in uh, the the latter part of chapter 3 and in chapter 4, we see that Paul, inspired by the Holy Spirit, talks about justification, which is a, a theologian's word for having your sins forgiven how God dealt with the symptoms of our sin problem. That my guilty acts are dealt with by the blood of Christ on Calvary's cross. That without the shedding of blood, there can be no forgiveness of sins, and that's exactly what Jesus Christ did when he shed his blood, was that he dealt with my sins. And that my sins are forgiven if I believe in the fact, now here's a scriptural fact, the fact that God is satisfied with Christ's blood payment. That's why in Romans 3 it talks about Christ being the propitiation for our sins. That big P word means that God is satisfied. Okay? <clears throat> but is that all there is to it? Is that all that there is to our salvation? That my sins are forgiven and then life just goes on the same as it did before? Well, you remember when we looked at the beginning of chapter 5 a couple of weeks ago that we said that there were at least seven other things that accompanied that. And I'm just going to flip through some of those slides quickly now and we won't spend a lot of time on them. But you remember in the first 11 verses of Romans chapter 5, we said not only are our sins forgiven, but I've been saved from the wrath of God. And we read about that in verses 9 and 10 of uh, Romans 5. And I have peace with God. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And that I'm positioned in God's grace, rooted and grounded just as this tree is in the position of God's grace, that is, in Christ Jesus. And that, not only that, but we celebrated this earlier this morning when Brother Chris spoke during our first service, that we not only have our sins forgiven, but we also have the indwelling spirit of Christ. <clears throat> and with that spirit comes this as well, that we are filled with the love of God. We now have a supernatural love that goes far beyond the love that this world knows, an unconditional, unbounded love. And that love abides in us because the Spirit of Christ, who is our life, abides in us as well. And we saw two weeks ago how we also have a different outlook on tough times. That we see that God uses tribulations to accomplish his purpose in us, that is to make us more like Jesus Christ. And finally, two weeks ago, we looked at this, that we rejoice in knowing that we've got a glorious future. That one day I'm going to see Christ face to face, not because I'm a good person. The fact is I'm not. But by the grace that God has shown me through Calvary's cross, that one day I'm going to see Christ face to face, I'm going to be changed into his likeness, and I'm going to spend an eternity in sinless perfection. Those are all things that come along with being justified. But is that all there is to it? What about this question of me sinning if I'm a Christian? I try to stop, but sometimes it just happens. Is that okay? Is it okay for me to just go on sinning like I did before? Well, you remember that we had this picture two weeks ago, a shot that was taken in the fall in Algonquin Park, and there's a little bit of snow 
dusted on the road or whatever. And we said that when we get saved, when we put our trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, it's a little bit like God taking us and putting us on this road. And we look around and we see what we see, beautiful trees and a little bit of snow and there's still a bit of color in it. And, and as we said last uh, a couple of weeks ago, some of you say, well, I wouldn't want to be there because I don't like the winter. Well, maybe there's a nice warm cabin over the hill. Remember, we talked about that. But when God puts us on uh, this path, so to speak, when he saves us through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, one of the first things that we see is that our sins are forgiven. And we look around and we say, isn't that marvelous? And we begin to look around a little bit more. And we did that two weeks ago when we were in Romans chapter 5, verses 1 to 11. And we begin to see that there's even more to it. As the further we walk down the path in our Christian life, the more we begin to realize and see and the more that God reveals to us the magnitude of what Jesus Christ did for me at Calvary's cross. It goes way beyond having my sins forgiven. Not that that isn't important. That is extremely important. It is the foundation of our salvation. That is that we're justified, that we have our sins forgiven. But there is more, and that's what the Apostle Paul is going to talk about in this passage that we're going to look at this morning. Let's take a look at Romans chapter 6, verses 1 to 11. It says, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? Or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. For he who has died has been freed from sin. Now, if we died with Christ, we believe that we also shall live with him, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no more. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life that he lives, he lives to God. Likewise, you also, reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Heavenly Father, we do thank you this morning for your word. We thank you for what we've just read, Father. Father, if we would remember nothing else uh, this morning from what we hear or see, that just your words, the words of these 11 verses that we've read, that they would resonate in our minds, that they truly would be real to us, Father, and that they would make an impact on our lives. Father, we confess that uh, we do wrestle at times and fall into to wrongdoing. And that indeed we do need you moment by moment and every hour. Father, we just trust that as we look into your word now that there is something indeed for each and every one of us here. That, Father, we want to go beyond having our sins forgiven and just continuing in an endless cycle of sinning and confessing and sinning and confessing. Father, we want to go beyond that. We want to go to the point where we experience victory over the awful power sin once had over us. Father, we know that the Lord Jesus Christ procured that victory for us. We've been singing about it this morning. And we just trust that as we look into your word now, that you will reveal these things to us, that they might indeed make a difference in our life. These things we pray in Christ's name. Amen. So, we often ask the question, Am I a sinner because I sin? Or do I sin because I'm a sinner? In our own minds, I think, at least I'll speak for myself, there's a tendency for us, for me, to think that the reason I'm labeled as a sinner is because I sin. That my label or my condition that I am a sinner is caused by the fact that I have sinned. Now, that may seem like splitting hairs to you, but in fact, I believe that's incorrect. The fact is, we sin, we commit unrighteous acts because we are by nature sinners. I believe that's what the Word of God teaches us. 
And you see, when Christ died on the cross and he shed his blood, part of our salvation was that he was going to deal with the symptoms. And we spoke a little bit about that already. That he was going to deal with those unrighteous acts, those guilty acts of sin, that they were going to be forgiven and dealt with and put away. But there's a marvelous thing that also happened at Calvary's cross, and we've just read about it. And that is that uh, God sought to deal with the root of the problem. You see, we sin because we're sinners, and our sins are outward symptoms of my inward sin problem. I've got a problem. Some of you that know me would say, well, Mark, in fact, you've got lots of problems. (laughs) You've got lots of problems, and you're right. You're right. But my sins, the the wrong things that I do, and they come quite naturally, I don't have to make any special effort to do them, they just happen, come about because I have an inward sin problem. You see, sin is a power and a force that works inside Adam's race. And the sins are just the logical outcome because of that sinful nature. And you see, if my sinning is going to stop, then that inward problem has to be dealt with, doesn't it? You've got to deal with the root cause of the problem if you're going to get rid of the symptoms. Any doctor will tell you that. And so if we look at this uh, uh, in that sense, we know that if this sinning problem for Adam's race is going to stop, that that inward sin problem has to be dealt with. This is a marvelous part of what the Lord Jesus Christ did at Calvary's cross. In fact, as I said in this slide here, it goes beyond the things that we've looked at already in in the first five chapters of Romans. It goes way beyond that. The scriptures say that we died to sin. And it's important for us to know the facts as we go through this passage, as we read through this. Excuse me for a minute. It's important for us to look at what God's word says and not to dwell in the realm of what I feel and what I've experienced and what I think, but to look carefully at what God's Word tells us. In verse 2, it says, How can we continue sinning like we did before? Because the fact is that we died to sin. We see in verse 3 that it says that we were baptized into Christ's death at Calvary's cross. And in verse 5, it says that we have been united together in the likeness of his death. From God's perspective, you were there when Christ was crucified. Now, don't think about that too much. Okay, Just focus on what God's word is saying for a moment. Just focus on the facts. These are the facts from God's perspective. In verse 6, it says, knowing this... And this is important. You've got to know this. I think on your outline it says something to the effect of there's something that you need to know. You need to know and you need to appreciate what Jesus Christ did at Calvary's cross concerning your old man. That is your old Adamic nature, your sinful nature, your flesh, as the scriptures describe it. That that old man was crucified together with uh, with Christ at Calvary's cross. That's why in 1 Corinthians 15, he's called the last Adam. Because Christ put an end to sin at Calvary's cross. From God's perspective. These are the facts as he sees them. And in verse 8, it says, Now, since we died with Christ, notice that. Past tense, it's a done deal, and it's over. Okay? God's word says we need to know these things. God has revealed to us in his word what Christ did at Calvary's cross that goes beyond the shedding of his blood under the forgiveness of our sins and it goes beyond that to the cross operating on my old man, my sinful nature, this part of me that just naturally sins. And you see, this teaching is not unique to the book of Romans. We see it elsewhere. And this is a key teaching in in the Pauline epistles. We know that famous verse in Galatians chapter 2 where the Apostle Paul says, I have been crucified with Christ, and it's no longer I that live, but Christ that lives in me. The life I live in this flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. There's Paul proclaiming that great truth and how it's operated on him. A statement of faith. I have been crucified with Christ. And in Colossians chapter 3, Paul reminds believers, you died 
and your life is hidden with Christ in God. And in 2 Timothy chapter 2, Paul says, since we died with Him, past tense, we also shall live with Him. Now this is something that as Christians we struggle with. Because we live in the here and now and we say, well, well, Mark, you're up there moving around and you're talking and you know, you're not dead. But let's just set that aside for a minute. Okay? Let's just set aside the things that are heard and are seen in, the, in this physical world and let's focus on what God's Word says, the facts as He sees them. Not only does this passage teach us that we died to sin through having been co-crucified with Jesus Christ at Calvary's cross, but that our old man has been put away. You'll notice it says in verse 4, therefore we were buried with him. Not only crucified, but buried. And in verse 6 it says, knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with. You know, when somebody dies, there's a finality to when they're buried. Their body is put away once and for all. And that's what the Scriptures teach happened at Calvary's cross. You see, this is referred to by theologians as the second major aspect of our salvation, our sanctification. That word sanctified, the Greek word that's translated in the Scriptures, comes from the same word that's translated holy. And it means to be set apart. You see, in my former state, before I put my trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, I was set apart from God. Mired in sin. I was dead in trespasses and sins. And I was separated uh, from God because I was inseparably linked to my sinful nature. There was just no way to get away from it. I just sinned in default mode, if you can use, use that terminology. It was something that came about quite naturally. And those of you that have children at least ones that have grown you know, to the age of at least two or three or whatever, maybe even younger than that, you'll see that, how naturally they sin. They don't need to be taught to sin. You will spend a tremendous amount of effort trying to teach your children to do the right things. And in spite of that, they will go off the rails and do the wrong things. Why? Because they're born with a sin nature. <clears throat> you see, we were once insepar inseparably linked to our sin nature, but Christ sanctified us at Calvary's cross. We often hear that word, sanctified, sanctification. And it maybe goes over our head a little bit because it's not a word that's used very much in our everyday conversation. But when we see that word sanctified, it means to set apart. And that's what, we, that's what has been done at Calvary's cross. Once inseparably linked to my sinful nature, I have now been set apart from it. That sin nature has been crucified and it has been put away, buried, once and for all. And so you see that we are now no longer slaves to sin, it says at the end of verse 6. That all of this has happened, that my old man was crucified with him so that the body of sin might be done away with or put away. Why? That we should no longer be slaves to sin. You see? It shouldn't be like it was before. If I've accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as my Savior, then there, there's going to be a change in my life because He's given me victory over sin's power. But you need to know that. You need to know that so that you won't continue in this endless cycle of sinning just as you did before. <clears throat> this next slide shows a young fellow that uh, is coming up out of the water in, in a baptism tank, similar to the one that we have uh, over on the right-hand side of our stage. And it goes beyond this in this description of what uh, Christ accomplished at Calvary's cross that we were crucified with Him and we were buried together with him, but the scriptures say that we were also raised up in a new life. This is what it means to be born again. That I have a new life. The old is gone, and the new has come. Right? It says that in 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 5 and verse uh, 17. Let me just turn there so I don't misquote it. It says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ... And that's a key statement because that's what God did was He positioned us in Christ so that we would be crucified, buried with Him, and raised up together with Him in newness of life. And if anyone is in Christ, He is a new creation. Old things have passed away, and behold, all things have become new. I'm born again. I have a new life. I'm raised up in newness of life 
with Christ. Isn't that what it says in verse 4? Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should walk in newness of life. I live a new life. The old life is gone, crucified and buried. In verse 5, it says that we have been united together in the likeness of his death, but we have also been united together with him in the likeness of his resurrection. We live in resurrection power. And as a result of that, it says in verse 7 that because we have died and have been raised up together with him in a new life, that we have been freed from sin's tyranny. Sin is no longer our master. We live in him, it says in verse 8. If we died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. And all of that is symbolized by water baptism. Water baptism doesn't make that happen. There's a lot of misunderstanding about what water baptism is all about. That if you get baptized, that something special is going to happen. Water baptism in and of itself has no power to do these things. What we've been reading in these first 11 verses is telling us about what happened 2,000 years ago at Calvary's cross. And when someone is water baptized, it's a proclamation and a celebration of something that has already happened. When this young fellow went down into the water, it symbolized him being crucified to his old nature having died. And when he was submerged in the water, that symbolized or portrayed his burial with Christ. And then as we see it in this picture, he's now coming up out of the water, having been completely submerged, symbolizes him being raised up together with Christ, in Christ, in newness of life. Water baptism is a beautiful portrayal of the truth that we see in Romans chapter 6. But keep in mind that these things that we're talking about, that I've been united with Christ in his death, burial, and resurrection, didn't happen when I got baptized. It happened when Christ died 2,000 years ago. My water baptism proclaims it and symbolizes it. And when we are baptized the way that this young fellow behind me was baptized, it ought to help give us a picture, a remembrance, a symbol that we carry around in us for the rest of our Christian life. When we remember how we were baptized, it gives us this picture that reminds us of what Jesus Christ did for us at Calvary, Calvary's cross. He dealt with my old man. He put him away and buried him. And I've been raised up together with him in newness of life. Now, some of this is tough. You see, well, I wasn't even alive 2,000 years ago. Mark, how could I have been crucified? And you see, when we begin to ask questions like that, it's understandable because we're stuck on this little timeline one day at a time. But God stands outside of all of human history and looks in on it just like it's a dollhouse. And he's telling us the truth in this passage. And he's saying, you need to stop seeing things from your earthly perspective and the perspective that you have stuck on the timeline of humanity. And you need to see things from my perspective. And I'm telling you this, that I have united you with Christ. You've been made one with him so that you can have victory over your sin nature. You see, despite what we may subjectively feel or experience, we can come up with all kinds of arguments and say, well, Mark, I've tried this. It doesn't work. I still sin. That may be true. But despite what you may have experienced or what you feel, these are the facts. This is what God's word says, and it will never change. Thank God. His word is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And the Christian life is about knowing those facts, isn't it? We've got to know what God thinks. The desire of the Christian ought to be to have the mind of Christ. I want to think like he does. I want to be like he is. And this is where it starts. It starts with having a focus on what the Word of God says. And this is why Paul says in verse 6, knowing this, you need to know this. There's something you need to know. Your old man was crucified at Calvary's cross. And you say, well, Mark, there's times I don't feel like I'm crucified. And I don't feel like my old man is dead because I sin. I'd ask you this. Do you always feel like you're justified? Are there times when you doubt whether or not maybe 
my sins weren't forgiven? Are there ever times that you entertain doubt? Do you always feel like you're a new creation and like you're born again? Again, is the Christian life about how you feel and what you think? Or is it about faith in what God's Word has told you? See, the Scriptures say that the just, that is, the just are those whose sins are forgiven by faith in Jesus Christ, shall live by what? Faith. It's all about me trusting what God's Word reveals to me as truth. <clears throat> Now, we now know, having looked at this, more about what Christ did at Calvary. He dealt with my sins, but he's also dealt with my sin problem, the root cause of my sin problem. That is me. He's taken me out of the way, and I was crucified with Christ on Calvary's cross, and my old man was put away. But if we're going to benefit from this, we need to go beyond knowing to something else. It's one thing to have a head knowledge, and we may have just gained a head knowledge of what the Word of God says. It's one thing to just know, and that's important. It's an important first step. But we need to go beyond knowing to what verse 11 says. Verse 11 says that we need to reckon ourselves to be dead indeed to sin. Now, if you've got an NIV Bible, it says count. Right? Anybody got an NIV Bible this morning? Count yourselves dead unto sin. That Greek word that's translated reckon in the King James Version, it's translated consider, I think, in the New American Standard. Somebody got a New American Standard? Consider yourselves dead unto sin. In the NIV, it says count. It's an accounting term, if we've got any business people in the audience. It's an accounting term, so to speak. You need to take stock. You need to take stock of what God's Word has said. You need to know what it says, and now you need to reckon on it, is what the Word of God says. Now, reckoning is not uh, supposing something to be true. It's not pretending. God's Word isn't saying, well, you know, this isn't really true, but you know, just pretend that it's true, or just suppose that it might be true. That's not what this Word is about. Count it to be true. Reckon upon it. Rely upon its truth. That's what we're being taught here in verse 11. Rely upon it. Put your trust and faith in its reality and its validity. Why is it valid? Why? Because God says it. God never lies. He says you're dead. Okay. And what we're being asked to do is to rely upon that truth and to be willing to act upon it now, if I'm dead, it means that, well, I'm not going to trust my old man, am I? I've used this example before, that if something were to happen and my heart was to stop and I was to fall off the stage and flat on my face, you know, maybe somebody would try CPR and after a while, it's over. And uh, it wouldn't be long before you would, you would take me and I'd be buried. But if that were to happen, and then... A couple days later, you said, man, look at the snowstorm we got. And I got all this snow out in my driveway, and I'm not feeling, feeling very well, and I wish somebody, somebody would help me do, do that, shovel my, my driveway. I know what I'll do. I'll ask Mark. Somebody would say, well, you're crazy. How come Mark can't do it? He's dead. Right? Mark can't do it. And that's where we need to come around to. When we reckon on this truth that the Word of God says that you're dead, your old man is dead, your old nature is dead, then why would you invite it or ask it to do anything? I've often said that for the Christian to grow spiritually, they need to develop a healthy distrust of themselves. You need to learn to distrust yourself. You cannot trust someone to do anything that is dead. They won't accomplish anything. Death just produces death. And if you cannot trust yourself, then who is it that that's going to bring you to trust? It's going to bring you to trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ, who is our life. He is the one in whom I find life. You see, to reckon on it, or to consider it, to count it means to rely upon its truth, to put our trust and faith in its reality and validity to the point that I act on it. And then once I've acted on it, then it becomes real in my experience. Hey, this does work. I am dead, and I have a new life. And God is giving me power and victory over my sins. 
We must first know the facts of God's word, but then we must act in faith upon them. What does it say in Romans chapter 10? We haven't got there yet. We're only in verse 6. But Romans chapter 10 and verse 17 says, Now faith comes by what? Hearing. And hearing by what? The word of God. You see the process? God reveals his word to us. He reveals his facts to us. Sometimes it's by hearing someone like me talking to you or by reading. But then the next step is to put your faith and trust in it. To reckon upon it. To rely upon it as truth. <clears throat> Our time is quickly disappearing. I'll show you this slide here. And I want to ask you the question. Tell me what blue is. What's blue? Somebody please tell me what blue is. Okay. I'm like this fellow, sitting on the sidewalk, completely blind from birth. And his little sign says, roses are red and violets are blue. That's what they tell me, because I'm blind. This man has no concept of the reality of blue. Go ahead, try to explain to him what blue is. Well, Al's got a blue shirt on. Sorry, Mark, can't see it. Mark's got blue eyes. His wife likes that. She comes from an Italian clan where they all have brown eyes. Sorry, Mark, I've never seen your eyes. Roxanne has a lovely blue sweater on this morning. Can't see that. Go out to the window. Look at that sky. The sky is blue. Blind man says, sorry, Mark, I've never seen it. It's not real. It, it has no concept to him. Right? What is it that makes the color blue real to you in your experience? It's these two things right here. If you've never had two eyes that have ever worked, blue, the color blue, will never be real to you in your experience. Never. Okay? Now hold on to that for a minute. Because your eyes are to the color blue what your faith is to the Word of God. Right? Let me say that again. Your eyes are to the color blue what your faith is to the Word of God. We've just read that the Word of God says that you're dead, that you were crucified with Christ, that your old man's put away, you've been given victory over your sin nature, and you're raised up together in newness of life. What's going to make that real to you in your experience? Why? Well, it's your desire and willingness to believe it, to reckon upon it, and to rely upon it as if it's true. J.N. Darby translates Hebrews 11 and 1 this way. We're used to it being translated something along the lines of now faith is the substance of things hoped for and evidence or conviction about things that aren't seen. Darby translated it this way and I think he had a, an insight into the meaning of this verse and in particular the word that's translated here substantiating. Faith is the substantiating of things hoped for and the conviction of things not seen. To substantiate something means to make it real in my experience, doesn't it? If I make a claim, somebody may challenge me to substantiate it, I'm able to demonstrate that it's real. And that's what faith does to the Word of God. It takes it from the point where we just know what the Word of God says, and I have head knowledge of it. Faith now takes it and it makes it real in my experience. That's the important importance of faith. That if we're going to experience victory over sin's power, we need to go to this chapter in Romans chapter 6. We need to see what it says. We need to know what it says. And then we need to reckon on it. Because when I reckon upon it, when I rely upon it, when I trust on it, it will make it real in my experience. As blue as blue is of the sky that's in this slide. That color blue is made real to you in your experience by your two eyes. What we've been studying this morning in Romans 6, 1 to 11, the reality that you will experience depends on your faith in what it says. It's not about what I think. The Christian life's not about me. It's not about my past experience. It's not about my failures. Oh, Christ dealt with those failures. The Christian life is all about me trusting in what God's Word says. Some have said it's not about the condition that I find myself in. Oh, there's days I'm in a real mess. Stressed out. Say things I shouldn't say. Whatever it might be. It's not about my current and present condition. It's about the position that I have in Jesus Christ. I was crucified with him. 
my old man put away, and I'm raised up in newness of life. <clears throat> you see in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 7, it says that we walk by faith, not by what? You see, in the physical realm, we walk by sight with these two eyes. But in the spiritual realm, too often, we are reckoning on the basis of what I see and what I think and what other people hear and say and what my own personal experience is. When in fact, we're not to walk that way when we walk with God. We're to walk by faith, trusting in what it is that He says. We walk by faith in God's Word, not by the way things appear to be. Faith substantiates the Word of God. It converts it from head knowledge into reality and a conviction that I'm willing to act upon. Do you have a conviction about what we've read this morning? See, we must not pilot our Christian walk based on how we feel or what seems to work or what doesn't work. God is our pilot, right? He's the one that's behind the controls. His word is truth. We should trust in what he says and live according to it because the just shall live by faith. Anybody ever read the book um, The Normal Christian Life by Watchman Nee? Great book. Nee had a real insight into some of these things, in particular into this middle part of the book of Romans. And uh, if you'd like to read the book, it's actually on our website. You can go and you can link to it there. You don't even have to buy it. You don't even have to print it out. It's there on our website if you'd like to look at it. He tells a little story of three little men. And the first man's name is fact. The second man's name is faith. And the third man's name is experience. And these three men are walking on a wall, one after the other. And the story goes like this. It says that fact, he was first. He walked steadily on turning neither to the right or left, and never looking behind. Faith followed, and all went well so long as he kept his eyes focused upon fact. But as soon as faith became concerned about experience and turned to see how he was getting on, faith lost his balance and tumbled off the wall, and poor old experience fell down after him. You see where your eyes need to be focused? If you're going to experience what we read this morning, that truly uh, my old nature has no power over me anymore and I've been crucified and I have victory over sin's power, that it's not going to be about always turning around and saying, well, you know, I tried that for a month or two and it didn't work. You're going to come off the wall. It's all about fixing your eyes on Jesus who is the author and perfecter of our faith, keeping your eyes firmly focused on the facts. This is why we need to look into the Word of God so often. You know, we don't read Romans chapter 6 once, just once, put it away, and never look at it again for the rest of your Christian life. You need to have your eyes on the facts, folks. We all do. You need to be constantly meditating upon the truth that God has revealed to us concerning what the Lord Jesus Christ has done for us at Calvary's cross. Just in conclusion then, on your handout, that we made two key points today. The first being this. You need to know this. What, what Paul, inspired by the Spirit of God, says in the first ten verses. That we are united with Christ in his death, burial, and resurrection. And we are freed from sin's power in Christ. But not only do you need to know it, but you need to count on it as true. Because in order to experience victory over your sin nature, you must reckon what God has revealed to you concerning your union with Christ as true. We turn over the back to the application and we'll take the time just a few seconds to read this. Uh, we recognize too that our, our messages are being recorded and posted on our website and some uh, will be listening on the internet and we'd like them to benefit from this as well. In our application it says that soon after we become Christians we run into an old problem, sin. Despite our best self-effort we naturally fall into bad old habits. Anybody been there? I sure have. I sure have. When we become aware of sin in our life, we should confess it to God and trust that Christ has interceded for our forgiveness. And we read about that in 1 John chapter 1 and 2. But does this mean that we should be content living in our old sinful ways? Not at all. Christ's death and resurrection went beyond dealing with our sinful acts to dealing with the root of the problem, 
our sinful nature. The last Adam put an end to the sinful ways of Adam's race at Calvary's cross. This may seem contrary to your feelings and experience. Put those things aside and learn to trust in what God's Word says is true. There is no other way to avail ourselves of victory except by faith. Contrary to the popular saying, and have you heard that old saying? Well, he's so heavenly minded, he's no earthly good. You ever heard that before? It's not true. Contrary to that saying, we in fact must be heavenly minded in order to be empowered to do earthly good. God's word says in Colossians chapter 3, set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth, for you died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. Let's close in prayer.